Once upon a time, in a quiet village called Maraba, there lived a young man named Gaji. Now, Gaji was different from others in his big family. You see, he was the only boy, surrounded by sisters as far as you could count. They loved him dearly, and he loved them too. But little did they know, it's just a matter of time before the beast in him incarnate. When Gaji turned 25, his time came. In Maraba, when a boy became a man, he couldn't stay in his parents' house anymore. It was the way things were. So Gaji packed his few things, waved goodbye to his family, and set off to a faraway town. His heart was filled with big dreams, and his feet moved quickly, carrying him far from Maraba. He dreamed of becoming rich, of wearing fine clothes and eating his fill every day. As he walked on, the road stretched out like a long snake, winding through hills and rivers, leading him to the town that sparkled in his mind like a shiny stone. Gaji was ready to find his fortune, to become the man everyone would be proud of. And with each step, he whispered, I'll come back rich. Just you wait. When Gaji finally reached the big town, it was nothing like Maraba. The buildings stretched up high like tall trees, and the roads were busy with people and noise. But for Gaji, things didn't go as smoothly as he had hoped. He tried many jobs, sweeping shops, carrying heavy loads, even shining shoes. But each time, something went wrong. Some days, he earned a few coins just enough to buy a small piece of bread, barely enough to fill his belly. His stomach rumbled like thunder every night, and still, he kept going. At night, Gaji had no place to call home. He would lay down wherever he could find a quiet corner, under trees, beside tall buildings, or even under bridges. One day, he'd sleep by the market, and the next night, he'd be by the river, huddling against the cold. But despite all this, Gaji didn't lose hope. Each morning, he woke up, brushed off the dust, and whispered to himself, Today will be different. And with that, he kept searching, dreaming that somewhere in that big town, his fortune was waiting. One day, as Gaji wandered the streets looking for work, he spotted a big, bright poster outside a grand house. The house was the largest he'd ever seen, with walls so high they seemed to touch the clouds. The poster read, Job Openings Inside. Gaji's heart leaped with excitement. Maybe this is it, he thought, his hope sparking like fire. He didn't wait another second and went straight to the tall iron gate, knocking firmly. After a few moments, the gate creaked open and a woman appeared her clothes neat and clean, her face calm. She led Gaji through a garden filled with flowers and trees to a man sitting right in the middle of the compound. This man was Taju, one of the richest men in the whole town. People spoke of him far and wide, not just for his wealth, but also for his strange ways. Taju never hired men. Every worker in his house from the cooks to the guards, was a woman. His driver was a woman. Even the gatekeeper was a woman. But Gaji didn't know this. He stood in front of Taju, eyes wide with hope, and said, Please, sir, I need a job. Taju looked at him, shook his head slowly, and replied, I don't hire men. It's my rule. Only women work here. Gaji's heart sank, but he didn't want to walk away empty-handed. He thought quickly and said, Sir, I have many sisters back in my village. If you don't hire men, maybe I could bring my sisters to work for you. Taju raised an eyebrow, curious. He thought about it, then smiled. If you bring your sisters, he said, I will hire them. And for every sister you bring, I will give you half of their salary. You'll make money without lifting a finger. Gaji's face lit up. This was even better than he'd imagined. He could earn money 
and help his sisters find jobs too. Yes, sir. I'll bring them, he promised, his voice eager, not even bothering to ask what work they'll be doing. As he walked away, Gaji's mind buzzed with plans. This is it, he thought, his chest swelling with pride. I'll show everyone in Maraba that I'm truly rich now. And with that thought in his heart, he started planning his journey back to the village to fetch his sisters, not caring to ask what kind of work Taju had in store for them. With excitement bubbling inside him, Gaji returned to Maraba, dressed in borrowed fancy clothes and arriving in a shiny car he'd rented just for the trip, knowing appearing this way will make the villagers believe all the lies he was cooking. The villagers gathered around, their eyes wide with awe. They could hardly believe the sight of Gaji looking so grand, like a man who had made it big in the world. Gaji stood tall, flashing a proud smile. I have great news, he announced, his voice booming with confidence. I've built a big company in the town. It's a place of high business, and I've come back to give my family a chance to share in the success. His family and neighbors gasped, their faces lighting up with joy and pride. They listened closely as Gaji went on. I want my sisters to come work for me. They'll have high positions, jobs where they'll manage others, earn good money, and drive fine cars. They'll become rich, and our family will be respected all around. The villagers looked at each other, nodding with approval. Gaji's parents were beaming, thinking their only son had truly made a name for himself. His sisters felt proud, imagining the bright future ahead. No one doubted Gaji's words. They all believed he was telling the truth. Don't worry, Gaji said, his voice smooth and sure. Your daughters will be in safe hands and they'll bring honor and wealth back to Maraba. And just like that, Gaji had convinced everyone. The village was buzzing with excitement and pride and his sisters were ready to live with him. They packed their belongings, dreaming of the new lives they'd live in the big town. Gaji, hiding his true plan behind a smile, led them away, confident that no one suspected a thing. Gaji arrived at Taju's grand house with two of his sisters by his side. The sisters looked around, their eyes wide at the towering walls and fine gardens. They thought they were going to a place of work, a place of honor. But Gaji hadn't asked a single question about what jobs they would do. He was only focused on the promise Taju had made, to pay him well for each girl he brought. Taju welcomed them with a sly smile. He didn't say much, just nodded and motioned for the girls to follow him inside. Gaji didn't hesitate. As soon as he handed his sisters over, he held out his hand, eager for his payment. Taju gave him a bundle of cash, more money than Gaji had ever held in his life. Gaji's eyes sparkled like stars as he took it not caring where his sisters went or what they'd be doing. Pocketing his new riches, Gaji set off for the village again. This time, he came with bags of food and money, enough to dazzle anyone who saw him. When he arrived in Maraba, he gathered his family and neighbors around, showing them the money and gifts. Your daughters are doing well, he said, smiling wide. They sent this as a sign of their success. Soon, they'll bring even more wealth to our family. His parents and the villagers look at the gifts with joy and pride. They believed every word Gaji said, never questioning where the money or food had come from. And so, with their trust secure, Gaji's plan continued. He had delivered his sisters to Taju, but his thoughts were already on the next trip back, knowing he could bring more girls and make even more money without anyone suspecting the truth. With the success of the first trip, Gaji became like a hero in Maraba. The villagers were so proud, 
seeing how his sisters were doing so well in the big town. Families began to approach Gaji, eager for their daughters to have the same chance. Take my daughter with you, they'd say. Let her work in your company and bring honor to us. Gaji nodded, his mind already on the money he'd make. Soon, he returned to Taju, this time bringing four girls, two of his own sisters and two girls from other families in the village. The girls were excited, hopeful that they'd soon have fancy jobs and a life of comfort. When they arrived at Taju's mansion, Gaji led the girls to the big gates without a single question. He handed them over, barely looking back as Taju's servants led them inside. All Gaji cared about was the weight of the cash Taju slipped into his hands. With each trip, Gaji's pockets grew heavy and his smile grew wider. He never stopped to think about what kind of work the girls were doing, nor did he ask to see his sisters. Taju was true to his word, paying Gaji each time he delivered more girls. And as long as the money flowed, Gaji didn't care to dig any deeper. Back in the village, Gaji became known as the man who brought riches. People looked up to him and the families were pleased, believing their daughters were in safe hands. And Gaji, feeling like a king, only thought about the next journey, dreaming of more money, more riches, and more girls to bring to Taju. As the days turned to weeks and the weeks to months, the village grew quieter. Mothers missed the sound of their daughter's laughter, and fathers began to wonder why they hadn't heard any news. No letters, no messages, just silence. When villagers asked Gaji about the girls, he would flash a warm smile and say, Oh, they're busy, working hard, learning new things, and soon they'll come back with even more for us all. Then he would pull out bundles of food and coins, spreading them around. Look, he'd say, this is from your daughters. They wanted you to have these gifts to show they're doing well. The villagers accepted the gifts, smiling through their worries. The food was fresh, the money was shiny, and Gaji's words sounded sweet, but still, a shadow of worry hung in the air. Late at night, families whispered to each other, wondering why none of the girls had returned, even for a short visit. Could they really be so busy? They asked each other worry glinting in their eyes like the faint light of stars on a dark night. But Gaji knew how to keep their doubts at bay. Each time he felt the villagers' questions growing sharper, he would return with even bigger gifts, a sack of rice, bundles of yams, and more coins than before. And with every visit, he would say, Be patient. They're doing well. Soon they'll bring back even more. And so the villagers nodded, telling themselves their daughters must truly be working hard. But deep down, a quiet worry still lingered, like a small ember waiting to grow into a flame. Gaji, however, blinded by the shine of coins, didn't see the shadow growing around him. Inside Taju's mansion, the truth was darker than any of the girls had imagined. Taju had lied to them, promising jobs that sounded respectable, but the reality was something far more sinister. Every night, wealthy men from the town would visit Taju's house. The girls were forced to entertain these men, to do things they never would have agreed to if they had known. Taju locked them away, kept them isolated, and threatened them if they refused. They weren't workers, they were prisoners, made to suffer for Taju's profit. Whenever one of the girls tried to escape, Taju showed no mercy. He would have his guards drag the girl back and the next day she'd be gone. No one knew where. The others whispered in fear, guessing that he'd unalive any girl who dared defy him. The message was clear. 
trying to escape meant certain doom. Rabi, Gaji's own sister, noticed the small crack in the door. Her heart began to pound like a drum, beating fast with a mixture of fear and hope. She looked around, seeing the other girls sitting silently, their eyes weary. Come, she whispered, motioning to them. This might be our chance. But the others shook their heads, their faces pale. No, Rabbi, they murmured. He'll find us. And if he does, they didn't finish, but Rabbi knew the fear that held their voices still. She nodded, understanding their fear. But her resolve grew stronger. She had to try, no matter the risk. With a deep breath, Rabbi tiptoed to the door and slipped through the gap. Feeling the cool air of freedom brush against her face, she crept down the path, each step careful and quiet, like a mouse escaping a sleeping cat. Once she reached the street, she broke into a run, her feet hitting the ground like the fast rhythm of a village drum. Rabi had no idea where to go. The city was vast, with streets that twisted and turned like rivers and she felt as small as a pebble in its wide expanse. For days, Rabi wandered, unsure of where to go. She had no food, no friends, and the city felt like a maze, twisting and winding like endless paths. But she kept moving, hoping to find someone, anyone who might help her. Gaji, still basking in his newfound wealth, was summoned by Taju one day. Taju's face was dark, his eyes colder than Gaji had ever seen. One of your sisters, Rabi, is missing, he said, his voice as sharp as a knife. You have to find her and bring her back. If she escapes, I'll stop paying you. Remember, we made a deal. Unsettled, but afraid of losing his fortune, Gaji set out to search the city for Rabi. He wandered the busy streets, calling her name and asking strangers if they had seen her. Days passed, and just when Gaji was starting to lose hope, he saw her, sitting weak and dirty outside a police station. Rabi, he called, his voice filled with a mix of relief and anger. Rabi looked up, her eyes red and weary. The sight of her brother broke her down, and she fell to her knees, tears streaming down her face. Brother, she whispered, her voice trembling. You don't know what's happening in that house. Taju, he's a monster. Every night he brings in strange men, rich men, who she choked on her words. The memory is too painful to speak. We're prisoners, Gaji. We're forced to do horrible things, things I can't even say. Gaji's face went pale but he quickly hardened himself, remembering Taju's words and the promise he had made. He had taken an oath to keep quiet, to never betray Taju, no matter what. If he broke it, everything, his money, his status, his so-called success, would vanish like smoke. He took a deep breath, steadying himself, then reached down and pulled Rabi to her feet. Come on, he said his voice low and cold. We're going back. Rabi's eyes widened in shock, her hands pulling back, but Gaji's grip was firm. You don't understand, she cried. You can't take me back there. He'll kill me, just like the others who tried to escape. But Gaji, blinded by his greed and bound by his promise, ignored her pleas. He tightened his grip and without a word led her back to Otaju's mansion. His heart heavy, but his mind fixed on the money he feared losing. Rabi's cries faded into the night as they walked, her hope slipping away with each step back to Taju's dark and twisted world. Unbeknownst to Gaji, Rabi had already spoken to the police before he found her. In those quiet, tense moments outside the station, she had poured out her story, telling the officers everything about Taju's house of horrors. She told them how each girl was brought with promises of work, but was instead trapped and forced into terrible things. 
their lives controlled by Taju's cruel hands. She explained that the girls weren't workers. They were prisoners, and any attempt to escape meant certain doom. Rabi had chosen her words carefully, leaving out Gaji's name. She feared that if Gaji knew she'd spoken to the police, he would stop her, maybe even try to silence her forever. She knew her brother was tangled in Taju's dark web, too blinded by greed to protect his own blood. So, she kept her secret, hoping the police would do something before Gaji brought her back to that terrible place. Gaji, on the other hand, thought everything was under control. As he returned Rabi to Taju's mansion, he felt relieved, even proud. He had done what Taju asked, and now his precious payments would continue. He believed he was safe, that his secrets were still buried deep. But Rabi had set things in motion, like the first crack in a dam. The police now had a glimpse into the dark world Taju had built, and while Gaji went on with his plan, thinking he had secured his fortune, the truth was quietly making its way to the surface, ready to burst open and change everything. As Gaji led Rabi back to Taju's mansion, they noticed something unusual from a distance. The front gate was wide open, and there were police cars parked all around. Uniformed officers moved through the grounds, their voices sharp and commanding. Gaji's heart sank, his hands going cold with fear. When they got closer, Gaji saw Taju, handcuffed and surrounded by officers. His face was no longer smug or confident. It was pale with anger and fear. The police were searching every corner of the mansion, opening doors, checking hidden rooms, and bringing out girls who had been trapped there, each one looking scared and relieved all at once. But even as they rescued some of the girls, it was clear to everyone that not all of them could be found. One of the officers confronted Taju, his voice firm. Where are the other girls? He demanded. Taju, realizing there was no escape, looked down and mumbled, I, I saw some and others. His voice trailed off, his eyes darting away. The officer's face grew dark with disgust as he listened, and Gaji's heart pounded like a drum, realizing just how deep the horror went. He had brought his own sisters, his own flesh and blood, into this nightmare without even asking what kind of work they would be doing. The truth was laid bare before him, and he couldn't hide behind his greed any longer. Before he could react, officers moved towards him, handcuffing him as well. You're under arrest too, they told him. You helped bring these girls here. You took the money and you stayed silent. Gaji tried to stammer, to deny it, but his guilt was clear, and there was no escaping the shame that flooded over him. Together, he and Taju were led away in cuffs, while the remaining girls, including Rabi, were taken into the care of the officers. The dark empire Taju had built crumbled in that moment, and Gaji, once the pride of Maraba, was now nothing but a prisoner, chained by his own greed and betrayal. When news of Gaji's arrest reached Maraba, it spread like wildfire. At first, the villagers were confused, unable to believe that their own Gaji, the man they had trusted, was involved in something so terrible. But as the truth unfolded, shock turned to sorrow, and sorrow to deep, burning anger. They learned that the girls hadn't been working honest jobs in the big town nor were they leading lives of respect as Gaji had promised. Instead, they had been prisoners in Taju's mansion, trapped and forced into shameful work against their will. The villagers were heartbroken, realizing that their daughters had been living in a nightmare while they had trusted Gaji's every word. Mothers wept openly, clinging to one another for comfort. Fathers clenched their fists, 
their faces filled with anger and hurt. They remembered all the times Gaji had come back to the village, dressed in fancy clothes and driving a rented car, bringing gifts and telling stories of success. It was all a lie. Every coin, every sack of food, every promise. The gifts weren't from the girls and the success Gaji had flaunted was nothing but borrowed shine. One by one, the villagers pieced it all together. Their trust in Gaji shattered like a clay pot dropped from a great height. They had believed him, let him take their daughters, thinking they would return with pride and honor. Instead, Gaji had betrayed them all, putting his greed above the safety and happiness of his own family and friends. He lied to us, they murmured, voices laced with pain. He used his own sisters, our daughters, just for money. The village, once filled with pride for Gaji's so-called success, was now filled with sorrow and a deep vow never to trust blindly again. They turned away from the memory of Gaji with heavy hearts, vowing that they would remember this betrayal for generations to come. In the end, both Gaji and Taju faced justice. The court sentenced them to life in prison a fitting punishment for the dark deeds they had committed. Taju, the mastermind of the scheme, and Gaji, who had sacrificed his own family's trust and love for greed, would spend their lives behind bars, left to reflect on the pain they had caused. Back in Maraba, the girls who had survived were finally returned to their families. They came home weary and changed carrying the weight of the hardships they'd endured. Their families embraced them with tears of joy and sorrow, grateful to have them back, but heartbroken over what they had suffered. The village was quiet, the air thick with the unspoken promise that they would never forget what had happened. The elders gathered the villagers, speaking solemnly, we must be wise in who we trust for even those closest to us can lead us astray. Let this be a lesson, one we will pass down to our children and our children's children. Meanwhile, in his cold prison cell, Gaji sat alone. The walls closed in around him, a constant reminder of the life he had thrown away. The weight of guilt lay heavy on his heart, pressing down like a mountain. He thought of his sisters, the innocent trust he had shattered and the pride he had foolishly clung to. Each night, memories haunted him. His family's smiles, the faith of the villagers and the look of betrayal in Rabi's eyes. For the rest of his days, Gaji would carry the burden of his choices, knowing he had turned his back on the people who loved him most. And in Maraba, the tale of Gaji's betrayal would live on a reminder of the high price of greed and the importance of true loyalty and honor. I hope you enjoyed the story. If so, please like the video, comment what you learned from the tale, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more enchanting tales just like this one. Thank you.